where does the mind go uh, when it's on psychedelics? I want to remind you of something you said, which is a, is a, a gem. It's not so much the experience, but the degree to which it can be integrated back. So here's a proposal. It comes from Woodward and others. A lot of convergence around this. Carhart Harris is talking about it similarly in the entropic brain. But I'm not going to talk first about psychedelics. I'm going to talk about neural networks. And I'm going to talk about a classic problem in neural networks. So neural networks, like us with intuition and implicit learning, are fantastic at picking up on complex patterns. Uh, which neural networks are we talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a general... A, a okay. Just general, both part. artificial and biological. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I, I think at this point there is no relevant difference. So one of the classic problems, because of their power, is they suffer from overfitting to the data. Or for those of you who are, you know, from a statistical orientation, they pick up pa pa patterns in the sample that aren't actually present in the population, right? Mm -hmm. And so. What you do is, there's various strategies. You can do dropout where you, you do periodically turn off half of the nodes in a network. You can drop noise into the network. And what that does is it prevents overfitting to the data and allows the network to generalize more powerfully to the environment. I propose to you that that's basically what psychedelics do. They, they do that. They basically do significant constraint uh, reduction. And so you get areas of the brain talking to each other that don't normally talk to each other, areas that do talk to each other, not talking to each other, down regulation of areas that are very dominant, like the default mode network, et cetera. And what that does is exactly something strongly analogous, sorry, to what's happening in dropout or putting noise into the data. It opens up, by the way, if you give people, if you give human beings an insight problem that they're trying to solve and you throw in some noise, like literally static on the screen, you can trigger an insight in them. <laughs> so like literally a very simplistic kind of noise to the perception system. Right. Can, it can break it out of overfitting to the data and open you up. Now, that means though, that just doing that, right, in and of itself is not the answer, because you also have to make sure that the system can go back to exploring that new space properly. This isn't a problem with neural networks. You turn off, drop out, and they just go back to being powerful neural networks, and now they explore the state space that they couldn't explore before. Human beings are a little bit more messy uh, around this, and this is where the analogy does get a little bit strained. So they need practices to help them integrate that opening up to the new state space so they can properly integrate it. So beyond Leary's state uh, 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 set and setting, I think you need another S. I think you need sacred. You need, psychedelics need to be practiced within a sapiential framework, a framework in which people are independently and beforehand improving their abilities to deal with self-deception and afford insight and self-regulate. This is, of course, the overwhelming way in which psychedelics are used by indigenous cultures. And I think if we put them into that context, then they can help the project of people self-transcending, cultivating meaning, and increasing wisdom. But if I think we remove them out of that context and put them in the context of commodities taken just to have certain phenomenological changes, we run certain important risks. So using the term of higher states of consciousness. Yes. Is consciousness an important part of that word? What, what, why higher? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it a higher state? So, or is it a detour, a, a side road? on the main road of consciousness? What, what? <laughs> so I Where think, do we go here? I think the psychedelic state is on a continuum. There's insight, and then if flow is an insight cascade. There's flow, and then you can have sort of psychedelic experiences, mind-revealing experiences, and then, but they overlap with mystical experiences, and they aren't the same. Um, so for example, in the Griffiths lab, 
they gave people psilocybin and they taught them ahead of time how like sort of the features of a mystical experience. And only a certain proportion of the people that took the psilocybin went from a psychedelic into a mystical experience. What was interesting is the people that had the mystical experience had measurable and long-standing change to one of the big five factors of personality. They had increased openness. And openness is supposed to actually go down over time. And these traits aren't supposed to be that malleable. And it was significantly like altered, right? Yeah. But imagine if you just created more openness in a person. Right, and they're now open to a lot more, and they want to explore a lot more. But you don't give them the tools of discernment; that could be problematic for them in important ways. That could be very problematic. Yes, I got it. But yeah. you know, so you have to land the plane uh, in a productive way, somehow integrate it back into your life and how you see the world and how you frame right. your perception of that world. And when people do that. That's when I call it a transformative experience. Now, the higher states of consciousness are really interesting because they tend to move people from the, a mystical experience into a transformative experience. Because what happens in these experiences is something really, really interesting. They get to a state that's ineffable. They can't put it into words. They can't describe it. But they they do this. This, this they're in this state, state temporarily, and then they come back and they do this. They say that was really real. And this in comparison is less real. So I remember that pl platonic meta desire. I want to change my life myself so that I'm more in conformity with that really real. And that is really odd, Lex, because normally when we go outside of our consensus intelligibility, like a dream state, we when we come back from it, we say, that doesn't fit into everything. Therefore, it's unreal. They do the exact opposite. They come out of these states and they say, that doesn't fit into this, right? Consensus, right? Intelligibility. And that means this is less real. They do the exact opposite. And that fascinates me. Why do they, why do they flip our, our normal procedure about evaluating alternative states? And what the thing is, those higher states of consciousness, precisely because they have that ontonormativity, the, 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 the realness that demands that you make a change in your life, they serve to bridge between mystical experiences a genuine transformative experience. So you do think seeing those as more real is productive because then you reach for them. So Yaden's done work on it. Um, you know, and it's, again, all of this is, like all of this stuff is recent. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. But, the, you know, by a lot of objective measure, people who do this, who have these higher states of consciousness and undergo the, and, and undertake the transformative process, their lives get better. Their relationships improve, right? Their sense of self improves, their anxieties go down, depression. Like all of these other measures, are the needles are moved on these measures by people undergoing this transformative experience. Their lives, by many of the criteria that we judge our lives to be good, get better.